Tonight we have Nancy Gutierrez, today's keynote speaker. I first met Nancy when she applied for the inaugural class of the Doctor of Education Leadership program in 2010. I knew that we had someone really special when I learned about her love for her family, her passion for her community, and that she wanted to be Secretary of Education for the nation's middle schools. You knew I was going to get that in, Nancy, because I thought she had to be crazy. Nancy spent her early career in her hometown of East San Jose, where she served as a special ed para, a teacher, and principal, where, by the way, she was named Principal of the Year in 2010. Soon thereafter, Nancy moved to Cambridge to begin her doctoral studies, and she maximized every opportunity she had here to learn, to grow, to lead, and to have impact on her EDLD cohort, HGSE, and on the sector. One of the ways in which she gave to our school was by her activism and leadership of AOCC. In fact, Nancy started the tradition of having an EDLD student as one of the three chairs of this conference, a tradition that is continuing with cohort nine EDLD -er, Marissa Alberti. As you can imagine, the first graduation of EDLD students was momentous, and not surprisingly, Nancy led the graduation march as the first EDLD Grand Marshal. And as she graduated, her family and East San Jose were still close to her heart. In her capstone dedication, Nancy wrote that East San Jose is, quote, the most beautiful community I've ever known. Let this shine as an example of our potential, the potential that schools have and the responsibility they have to nurture, to develop, and never doubt. Our struggle is our motivation. Our resilience is our strength. This is for us. And to the family and friends watching the live stream in East San Jose, you know that that is our Nancy. Upon graduation, Nancy worked for the New York City Department of Ed before becoming the organization's chief strategy officer for the New York City Leadership Academy. In that role, she helped to oversee the nonprofit organization's shift from focusing on growing principles in New York City to its current mission of developing equity-minded schools, districts, and state education leaders across the nation. And then, in October 2018, Dr. Nancy B. Gutierrez was named the President and CEO of NICLA. Having been mentored, as she said, by some of the leading women of color in education, Nancy is committed to giving back and has mentored women, particularly women of color, across the nation. As someone who has watched with great pride the strides she has made, it is my honor to present to some and introduce to others our keynote speaker, Dr. Nancy B. Gutierrez. Testing. Awesome. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Hi. I'm Nancy Gonzalez. <laughs> so excited to be here. <laughs> so this is this is a really special moment for me because uh, as the theme. The theme this year is around homecoming, and this is the place where I really felt at home here at Harvard. You are the community that kind of that helped me through this experience, and today we want to talk about that um, after I do a few shout outs and introductions. First, I need a shout out, and I just want to say the Kuma Singers, can we give it up for them again? I mean. And in the introduction, they do. In the introduction, it was said, this is a space where black students felt safe to be home, to be themselves, to engage. And that's exactly what we're talking about um, today. 
Want to shout out any NICLA APP staff um, or APP grads, Harvard EDL DFAM, uh, Extra Left for C1 and C2, uh, Ed Lock, um, AOCC past, present, and future. Got, got lots of chairs, former chairs in the room. Um, founders, any founders? I know Heather Harding's over here. Any other founders in the room? All right. Darren, good to see you. Um, also, Latinos for Ed family, New York State, Alas, got my, my three superintendent brothers here who drove all the way up from New York State here to see me. Uh, my NYU student, Carolina Reyes, came all the way up. Thank you for being here. Um, and my eighth grade teacher, Mr. Lovelace, is live streaming, so I want to say thank you to him for that. And you'll hear a little bit more about him. And of course, my fam, Sonia, Ava, Chris, Angie, Jaden, and my huge Mexican family back home. They're all watching. And, uh, and I want to say. But as, as we are here, let's be sure to honor the fact that others were here before us. In the naming of indigenous and native communities and nations, we acknowledge the pain. We also acknowledge how they are still rendered invisible by our policies and actions, including at a place like Harvard. Please join me in honoring the peoples on whose land we are standing. The Mohegan Nation, Pawtucket and Penacook, Massachusetts, the Pocantoket, the Wampanoag Mashpee and the Wampanoag Akina, the Nipmuc and the Pocumtuck. Now, AOCC, um, this, this keynote is going to be interactive. Uh, and AOCC truly, in, in many ways, is a form of resistance, right? Right? Yeah. All right. And for me, the theme of homecoming um, is perfect because in many ways, this is where we can really push each other. We can really be most at home. I still remember in 2000, was it 2011, my first year here, Christina Dobbs, I know you're in the room. Uh, she was a chair in 2011. You were the, one of the tri-chairs of AOCC. And I remember that we would be um, at Rosario's house, another chair, and Anita Vadva, all four of us would be making uh, flour tortillas from scratch while we were planning for this conference. And that was, you know, reminded me of home. That's what my mom would do, right, on Saturdays with the flour tortillas, the masa, the little butter. Um, and so those are some of the, the spaces. And we, in the following year, um, I would step up to be one of the co-chairs. Try chairs. So these are, you know, these are some nerds who thought we were like gangster for a day. Uh, and this is Jung Cho, Don Miller, and myself, and we were the uh, tri chairs for 2012. Uh, and I will never forget. Uh, and this is the Fuller team here with Lee Manuel, one of our keynotes. Now, ASC is a special place, not only because we explore issues we know and feel strongly about, do not typically name and lift in other spaces. Um, but also because um, we were founded to highlight the lack of diverse faculty, faculty here at Harvard. We were also um, really thinking about the fact that amazing alumni of color were not coming back to campus. And maybe when they were here, they didn't feel welcome to be here. And so creating spaces to welcome us every single year um, has been really beautiful. And again, thank you to the founders for that. And also because um, we have the best dance parties on Saturday nights. I don't know if you guys know that. All right. Now, even during planning meetings, um, we get down. Push it up, push it up, push it up. That's your house, yeah. Well, you can see she's leading us. She's like giving us your thoughts. That, Nancy Gonzalez told me to do that, Deborah. That was not, not, my, not my idea. Now, if you're here for the first time, we welcome you. Here, not only do we see color, but we see all the intersections of your identity. And we love who you are. And we welcome who you are. Your identity matters. And we also welcome our white allies and all the co-conspirators in the work to bring about social justice and collective liberation. Now, Maya Angelou defines home for us, um, and I'd love for us to read that together. I was a former teacher on the count of three. One, two, three. The ache for home lives in all of us, the safe place where we can go and we will not, not be questioned. Now, our young people in schools today, they often face tremendous challenges finding their home in schools. And we as education leaders have that responsibility, right, to create spaces where they're manifesting their gifts, their brilliance, and thriving. 
And it's not only for our students. How many of you in the room feel that way too? Right? Always kind of searching for a home, always trying to engage. And it's not always easy for, oh, that's the young people. That's Angie. That's my niece. Um, but it's not always easy for people at Harvard. All right, give her some love. <laughs> It's not always easy for people at Harvard to, to, people of color at Harvard to feel like this is home. While it's the oldest institution of learning in our country, it has lar long been largely university for white students and white professors. In fact, Sarah Lawrence Lightfoot, the first African American woman in Harvard's history to have an endowed professorship named in her honor and who will be retiring this year, I think almost 50 years. She stood here on this stage as our keynote in 2012 and she said, I have been on faculty since 1972, and this place has never felt like home to me. Now let's take a look at some stats. Today, U.S. population, about 60% 60, 60 white, 40%, um, and we're creeping up. But look at, when you look at the actual student population, when you look at the student population, since 2015, the majority of babies born in this country are our beautiful kids of color. And in the 2015-16 school year, the combination across all of our communities is larger than the percentage of white students. Yet in many ways we're still catering to what we think the majority is. Here at the Graduate School of Ed, uh, about 31% graduate students of color here on campus, including master's and doctoral students. Um, I will shout out the EDLD program. We have an average of 53% students and graduates of color. Now, when you think of home, what comes to mind for you? Um, and I'd love for you to turn to the person next to you. And this, you're going to turn to this person about three times during this keynote. And then when you hear this, you're going to come back. So for three minutes, when you think of home, what comes to mind? Turn to the person next to you and go. Now, I too faced real challenges at first in making this place, Harvard, my home. Though I consider myself first and foremost a homegirl. <laughs> I grew up in East San Jose, a beautiful predominantly Mexican community. Lived near the Storing King intersection where lowriders would cruise on the 16 de septiembre. Our independence date is not Cinco de Mayo. <laughs> uh, and where we would, during, in, our, in our high school quad, we would literally sing Chentes Volver, Volver, and La Quad. We were almost 100% Mexican in our high school. Um, and where we, we truly embraced Spanglish as our official tongue. And, you know, instead of saying, you know, want to grab some lunch, it was want to grab some lonche. Or instead of, <laughs> instead of like, you know, like, like, let's go to the, you know, let's, let's go to the fiesta, I'd be like, you want to go to the party? 
uh, or or any cereal would be cornflake, right? It wouldn't be. It wouldn't matter. If it, it could have been like pops or Rice Krispie treats. Um, and indeed, I had I had this actually. This picture is interesting. This comes from. This is actually uh, one of my current board members. This is his lowrider. Back in the day, he's a former superintendent, Hector Montenegro from Texas, who lived in San Jose for a few years, did a little cruising back in the day, just joined my board. And um, can you imagine how it felt becoming the new CEO of an organization and having a board member send, send me a lowrider? Like, just, send me a <laughs> just, just the connectivity and, and, um, has been really beautiful, and he gave me permission to share that. Um, <laughs> But I, I actually had the privilege of serving my community for the majority of my career. And then I left my family, my friends, my community to come here for this opportunity. Uh, and and that, was, that was a really, um, that was a struggle for me, a lot of complexities in that journey. And what I did was I, um, I basically went through some old emails that I sent my family and my sister and my family probably remember me sending these. And I'm just going to read you some excerpts from on week one, on day one, let me go here real quick. Oh, it's a little blurry. On day one, the EDLD faculty asked us to step back from doing and begin reflecting, to experiment with the freedom afforded to us as students, to fail, to be disturbed, to suspend judgment, to be resilient, to forge genuinely new kinds of relationships, to give attention to what feels most uncomfortable and stay there. But I'm struggling with this idea of failure being a good thing, especially because I don't only represent myself, but all of you here every single day. And for many of us in this room, that is what being at Harvard is, representation, not only for our race or ethnicity, but for our family, our community, of the people we had to leave behind to pursue this opportunity. For a kid from East San Jose to get her doctor from Harvard was a really big deal, almost 10 years ago when I started this journey, and it still is, and that's not okay. Week two. I said, yo. <laughs> Here we go. I said, as strong as I seemed when I was back with you all on the east side, I thought I was all that in a bag of chips. I'm realizing how weak I truly am. I'm having trouble finding my voice. I'm afraid to speak. I fear I'll sound stupid. I have to keep reminding myself that getting accepted here was not a mistake. I belong here. I belong here. I belong here. And where the hell do you get good Mexican food? <laughs> Week three. I'm slowly finding my voice, but only when I'm talking about you, about us, about what schooling meant for our community, about the way school failed us. Your experiences and names are important for me to say here. Maritza, Nayeni, Patrice the OG, Sole, Paulina, Elida, Big Monica, Little Monica, and Pedro. They're up there. My buddies since we were like in kindergarten. You'd be surprised, this is week four, you'd be surprised to know how uncommon our story is for someone who makes it here. Shitty schools, single parents, raising each other in the barrio. The one thing that keeps me going is mommy seeing her go back to college when I was in high school was one of the most powerful experiences of my life. Not just knowing that she went back, but seeing her come home every day defeated, anxious, and full of tears, feeling like a failure. And she's so far from that and has been a great source of humility. Now, in The Privileged Poor, Dr. Anthony Jack talks about he reveals the struggle of less privileged students continues long after they've arrived, arrived to a campus. Admission, they quickly learn, is not the same as acceptance. Week four, I mean the final week, week five. This is a letter to myself. I stopped writing them. I was like, man, I'm getting them depressed. <laughs> <laughs> so this is just a letter to self. I was to Nancy from Nancy. Can you believe you're here? I still can't believe I got in. I mean, shit. This is scary, but stay focused, do it for the fam. And by the way, cohort one is awesome. Remember that they need to learn from you just as much as you need to learn from them. So go out there and represent con ganas and never forget how fortunate you are to be given this opportunity. Always be humble and grateful and never forget your homies and tu familia. Now that was about the time, about week five, when I met the folks of AOCC. 
And when I found a home, when I found a home within a home. Now this was a space where we were able to raise our voices, reinforce and amplify our experiences. And imagine the impact of coming here to my first AOCC and hearing. Angela Valenzuela, who we also, all, by the way, she went to the Saturday night party and was getting down. I remember, I, have, I had pictures of that too, I almost shared. Um, she was talking here on this very stage about the danger of youth falling prey to subtle but unrelenting messages of the worthlessness of their communities, that their languages and cultures are not valued. Imagine hearing that in a space like this. Empowerment, vulnerability. Or when AOC keynote Patricia Hill Collins spoke about the fact that oppressed groups are frequently placed in the situation of being listened to only if we frame our ideas in the language that is familiar to and comfortable for the dominant group. Now this requirement often changes the meaning of our ideas and works to only elevate the ideas of dominant groups. Again, being in this space and hearing this empowerment. Lee Manoir, 2012, he says, it's a huge myth that our country values difference. He said, I don't think so. We're gonna, we have to walk through our fears before we're gonna be able to see another world. And then there's Deborah, Dr. Deborah Jill Sherman. And, what? <laughs> Dr. Deborah Jewel Gonzalez. Um, <laughs> we, were, uh, we were trying to get Sonia Sotomayor to come and be one of our keynotes in 2012. And, um, and um, Deborah wrote a letter to her, and I found it a few weeks ago when I was preparing for this, and I just I took a little excerpt from it. But you think, you know, you think about someone like Deborah, you think about someone who just has it together. People think I have it together. I'm like, I don't got it together. <laughs> you know, but you look, you, you just, you're so, you know, you're, you're someone a lot of us achieve and aspire to be. And yet you still need inspiration, right? We all need inspiration. And Deborah wrote to Sonia Sotomayor, she says, you are the living embodiment of our parents and grandparents' hopes and dreams. I cite you as one of my sheroes and reference you that you were a girl three years my junior who lived in the Bronx Dale housing projects. I lived at 1020 Soundview Avenue and who attended Blessed Sacrament and later Cardinal Spellman High School, as did I. We collectively are extremely proud of what you have accomplished and appreciate the tremendous service you provide our nation from your place on the Supreme Court. Vulnerability, truth-telling. Now, Heather Harding, one of our AOCC founders, uh, said to me recently, you know, we have to remember how hard it is to be in these spaces where incredible privileges are afforded to us while taxing the hell out of our asses <laughs> At this political moment, I am grinding on any opportunity to call out necessary black, brown, POC coalition building that must be, take, must be about taking down white supremacy. And let's put that into context about what's happening today, hoy en día, right, today. Today we see teachers even in Idaho uh, in 2008 wearing insensitive costumes on Halloween, jump, you know, dressing as a border wall. We experience heartbreak when many of our leaders, even those who we thought were co-conspirators of justice, who engage in racist behavior such as wearing a black face. We reject families seeking refuge in their quest for freedom. Instead, we vilify them and lab label them as criminals and rapists. We hurt them, separate families. We, even in a place like Massachusetts, the most highly ranked state for education in the country, the disparities are glaring and persistent. From the, number, the, from the number one for some report, in Massachusetts, less than one in three black and Latinx fourth graders are on grade level in reading. Half the rate of the state's white students, one in three English language learners don't graduate on time. One in seven drop out entirely. Too many graduates of color don't enroll in post-secondary education at all, and among those that do, too many take remedial courses. We're also seeing the administration reverse policies around discipline, uh, protections for students of color, yet the facts are indisputable. Students of color are more likely than their white peers to be suspended or expelled, often for similar offenses, a disproportionality that is mirrored in our country's criminal justice system. As my first year as principal, I, I remember I, I had 1,550 referrals sent to my office, majority of which were for disruption and defiance. So what does that even mean? I'm gonna ask you to turn back to your buddy. I'm gonna ask you, what are the current events in today's context that fuel you? What keeps you at, uh, up at night? What fuels that fire in you? We're going to have three minutes again. Go.
sure you shout out some issues that feel you. I just want to take a few. What are some issues that are on your mind that you think about that you are actively working? Jump in. Nice and loud. Thank you. So, like, an example would be, like, uh, something that happened a couple years ago at my school where a teacher sent out an email because she was offended and felt like the student was being disrespectful to her when he did the W. Mm. And so that raised a huge issue um, at our school. In terms of Thank you. One more? Mm -hmm. okay. Nice and loud? Mm. Your zip code, unfortunately, in this country determines what level of education you will get. Mm. I go to boroughs and areas of New York that nobody wants to go to, mm -hmm. and I take a lot of pride in spending a heck of a lot of time in the South Bronx, in East Harlem, in West Harlem, in Far Rockaway, and try to encourage the teachers that I train for a living to develop the passion and give these kids what everybody else is getting. Mm -hmm. Dr. Deborah Jo Sherman calls that demography, demography is a destiny. All right. I, I'm going to, is that okay? Okay, I'm dying. What, okay, go. That's a nice one. Okay, so I own a school in New Jersey, in Newark. I'm in the uh, higher education to trade school. And I'm just wondering why more of you guys don't open your own schools. Why? Because I'm not even a teacher, and I saw a problem, and I opened the school. And I see great teachers, like what you just said. Why wouldn't you open the school? All right. So it sounds like a conversation that will continue over the, the course of this, of this. All right. So, Jahari, you know I had to give you some love here. Now, amidst all of this, Marshall Gans always reminds us to balance urgency with hope. That challenge equals opportunity. This is a moment when, when we have had more women and people of color in Congress than we have ever had before. And we even have AOC rocking her hoop earrings and red lipstick, inspired by Sonia Sotomayor, tweeting, next time someone tells Bronx girls to take off their hoops, they can just say they're dressing like a congresswoman. <laughs> in addition to being more women of color in Congress, dozens of teachers were elected to office, including our 2016 National Teacher of the Year, Johanna Hayes, Connecticut's first black congresswoman. Now, this is a moment when historically marginalized groups are creating powerful movement, movements Arab Spring, the Women's March, Black Lives Matter, Me Too, March for Our Lives. In the words of Hugsey Professor Myra Levinson to Ed Magazine, we are in a groundswell movement of youth activism. Now, we know that education is our most powerful weapon against history repeating itself again and again. Um, Dr. Ghislaine Gunu always reminds us in all of the work that, that, that you do across the country and with folks, you always say, are we learning from our past? Sankofa, right? literally means go back and get it, go back and fetch. Learn from our past in order to inform our future, to understand our present, and to, and to transform. Uh, when, now, when we think about our sphere of influence, each of us are in different spheres of influence, and I think this relates to what you're saying about the school. We all will choose our place in the sector, where we will make a difference, how we will engage um, with the world. And in order for every child to, be, to learn and fully benefit, uh, we have to create spaces where they feel like every space is, a, is, is home for them, right? They can engage in ways that are, are what we would call in EDSPE culturally relevant, culturally affirming. Uh, <laughs> um, and we're talking about specifically historically underserved students, children of color, students with special needs, English language learners, gay and transgendered youth, students living in poverty, those who have experienced trauma such as homelessness and abuse, children who have emigrated to our country, now, I want to go through every, basically every uh, three different parts of the sector, teacher, school leader, uh, and system level leader. And I'm going to start with 
a teacher. Um, where when I th we think about teachers, we think about we think about that being the closest unit to a child, right? The interaction between teacher, student, and content being the direct connection every single day. And as a teacher, you can literally change the trajectory of children. You can hold high expectations. You can make sure the curriculum reflects students that the heroes and sheroes you are talking about actually represent, represent and reflect your students in the room. I do believe that the most powerful political action takes place in that classroom. Uh, and I'm going to show you myself in eighth grade. The one here to the, I told, I told you I was a homegirl. Uh, yeah. <laughs> now, Mr. Lovelace, my eighth grade teacher, he would tell me uh, the story about how before eighth grade started, before the eighth grade year started, you know how when, the, when you create classes and you have the cum folders and you move them around and you're making sure classes are balanced, that people were passing my folder uh, along because I had a little bit of reputation for uh, being disruptive, disruptive defiant. Um, and he took it and he said, I'd love to have her in my class. Now, one of the things he did uh, that year was, I feel like he actually saw me and he accepted me as I was. And he said to me, you know, welcome to class. Like, and he was genuinely interested and excited about having me and learning from me. Um, and that year he would encourage me to submit an essay uh, for a state level competition for $250. I was super excited. I was like, he's like, you're a good writer. I was like, I am. Uh, and he said, you know, let's, let's submit. And he said, and I want you to do it from your own voice. I do not want you to do it the way you think you have to do it or should do it. I said, okay. So here was the winning submission. I, I lost. <laughs> here, here was, I'm going to read you just a few sentences from the winning submission. Uh, education prepares us for the future. Doing well in school means a good college, and a good college means a good education, even if it means staying up until 1030 studying for a scientist. For, all good but pretty traditional, pretty typical. Here was, my, here was my submission. All right. A woman the age of 27, tattooed, drugged up, four kids, being raised by their grandmother. Norteño husband who beats her to death and literally socks her every move, a homegirl. A man the age of 29, tattooed up, four abandoned children, no job, always getting locked up, a drug, a drug and alcohol user and abuser, a drug dealer, wife abuser, now wifeless, a homeboy. These are stories of dropout gangsters who weren't able to get their full education, people I love, familia. Why waste your time living lives like this when you can get a good education, live a happy life? You see, you see where I'm going with this. I was just speaking from the heart. <laughs> Mr. Lovelace would later tell me that I lost the competition, not because it wasn't a competitive piece, but because the people judging the piece didn't know how to relate to an experience they didn't know. The, the, disconnected between, the, dis the disconnection between teacher and student unsure of how to respond to something unfamiliar. Now let's move to the school leader. Now we have to do the, when we're talking about, we're talking about scale and impact, we talk about the different units, right? When you get to the school leader, uh, it becomes more exponential and you can create spaces where you are, know, you know every student by name, where you are creating um, spaces that are not just about food, fun, and fiesta, but really about, um, about who students are. Now, many of you know, I think, Michelle Shannon, uh, former Boston Public Schools Chief of Schools, uh, and who now is on my team, um, and who was also Los Angeles Unified and was a New York City principal. But she tells a story about how she would graduate top of her class from her high school uh, in Queens, and she would, she was, you know, she was feeling good. She went to a uh, local college. She gets to class, and on the very first week, her math teacher said, all right, let's review some basic high school math. And she said she, she, it looked like hieroglyphics. She, it looked, looked, looked scary. And she continued to you know, try to go, but at week three, she, she stopped going to math class. She didn't know who to go to for help. She lacked the courage to admit not understanding. And at the end of her first semester, she dropped out, spent the next five years waiting tables at Red Lobster. And when she told us this story, she, she talked about a, a, a teardrop falling into a margarita that she was serving to a customer at Red Lobster, thinking about her life and uh, being, being at Red Lobster. Now, this actually is not an unusual story. Many of us have felt very unprepared for college. Uh, raise your hand if you felt unprepared. You were like, what the? Yeah, I did too. And for, for me, I think about this as what was a school leader doing or not doing to let you leave that school and make you believe that you were prepared when you actually weren't? What kind of space was that was being created for that? Now, Michelle, well, she would end up coming back. After five years, she would muster the courage. She would go back to school. 
She would become, she would join the New York City Leadership Academy, become one of our aspiring principals, graduate and, and found a school. Um, and her, her vision as a school leader was to basically prevent everything she experienced. Uh, and she says here, I'll have someone with a loud voice in the back read that for us nice and loud. You can do that for me. It's a mix of voices. Our students did not write papers. They published essays and short stories akin to what real writers produce for their readers. They learned how to use algebra to solve real world problems. They conducted scientific experiments and research. Thank you, Shar. Now, system level leader. And again, this keeps getting more and more exponential. Now, you think about Richard Elmore always talks about fractal architecture, about how even the smallest unit can be replicated and can grow and grow um, with the same exact shape and dimensions. Uh, and when I think about system level leaders, I always think about, um, about Newburgh, New York. Now, this is um, from 2010, the New York Times, it was titled, In Newburgh, Gangs and Violence Reign, Where Gang Violence Devours Youth. And this was the cover. In um, 2011, New York Magazine named, named it the murder capital of New York State, said it was one of the most dangerous four, four mile stretches with a higher rate of violent crime per capita than the South Bronx or Bronxville or Brownsville, excuse me. Now, here's my buddy over here, Dr. Roberto Padilla. Why do I keep getting emotional when I talk about you guys? Man? But this was the, this was, there were so, how long have you been souped there now? Five, five years. So five years ago, because, you know, we're Latino, so like we packed in a car. We drove all the way upstate to see him get named by the board as superintendent. And I remember we walked in, and the security guard, who was in the front, she said, little Robert? <laughs> she had known him from when he was a little boy. And she said, you're going to be our superintendent. <sighs> now, whoa. In five years, they've seen increased graduation rates, increased access to rigorous courses, new innovations in schools and programming. And most importantly, Dr. Padilla has been building a coalition of people to challenge the status quo by his side. Um, now, here are a few quotes there. Shahar, you had such a good voice. I'm going to have you do that again. <laughs> we cannot just look at numbers and create an action plan. When we talk about impacting students, it is critical that we enlist their voices. Imagine what it would do to a kid in our school system if we take them and love them up. And this... <laughs> and this year, uh, in May... Uh, Dr. Padilla will be named one of our Ed Week leaders to learn from. Yes. But again, going back, he went, he, going back to his community. Now, what is your sphere of influence? And within your sphere, what voices have you been intentionally or unintentionally not brought to the table? You know, turn to the person next to you, and within your sphere of influence, how are you thinking about this work? Three minutes.
That was powerful. Oops. Thank you for sharing. Um, now, where is home in leadership? And how do we ready ourselves for this work? I'm going to share, you, share with you a few lessons that I've learned um, and how I think about readying myself and keeping myself grounded in the work. Oops. Find, <laughs> everyone loves Gloria and Zardua, I know, it's coming, it's coming. Find home in the values that you live. When you, when you have core values and you know them, you name them, you live them, you are always close to home. Use who you are and what you stand for as a guiding light. Stick to your values even when they are unpopular. As it will be when you call out racism, homophobia, xenophobia, sexism, classism, ableism, etc., etc. Bring home wherever you go. Gloria Anzaldúa, oh, she says, I am like a turtle wherever I go, I carry home on my back. <laughs> now this is true. Even when you try, you see people who try to act like they ain't from a certain, you're like, come on. <laughs> I have one of my friends uh, who went to high school with us because our high school was considered one of the worst. He would wear a, a class ring and uh, he, would, he would play volleyball and every time they asked him which high school, he would like flip his ring over and say a different school. And I'm like, you're not fooling anyone, man, come on. But surround yourself with people who will push you to be your best self, to stay inspired, and never, ever, ever forget where you come from and what you've experienced. Respect others' homes. Now the answer is always in the room that is something we say at the Leadership Academy often, that you are not coming in as a savior, you're not here to save anybody. Our communities are rich, powerful, knowledgeable, and have the answers within communities. Thank you. Give special attention to those voices that have been historically marginalized or ignored as you do this work. And reject the leave, what Dr. Padilla and I are calling the leave to succeed mythology. That we, that there's this, there's something that is told to our students over and over and over again, that if you want to be succeed, you got to get out. And that's not the reality. Just like Dr. Padilla, you can come home. Just like me, you can come home. And you can be your best self and serve your community. Broaden your definition of home. Now, in many ways, I, thought I was born to only serve East San Jose my, for my entire life, and I would have been happy doing so. What I have found is so many commonalities across the country in different communities. Now, Ralph Ellison says, it is not geography alone which determines the quality of life and culture. These depend upon the courage and personal culture of the individuals who make their home in any given locality. And finally, never forget your homies. <laughs> you got to stay connected to the most important parts of yourself and the most important people in your life. This work is important, but not more than your mental health, than your sanity, than feeling loved, feeling cared for, than finding balance. Those things are important. Um, uh, there's a group of us, uh, women of color, who aspire to superintendency. And in all truth, we talk about the women we've literally lost, who have literally died. Mary Goodlow Johnson recently, and uh, Michelle King in Los Angeles. So many women are experiencing this, specifically women of color. And in many ways, we say, are you going to do it? Are you going to do it? Are you ready? And we say, I'm scared. Because there's so much stress that comes with the job alone. And imagine add adding sexism and racism and all those things onto that. Now... <laughs> So when I was, I sought advice from my friend Poonam Singh, who uh, is in the Bay Area, an Indian woman. And I said, I said you know, she, she went to Harvard, she was part of the AOCC community, she never chaired it, but she was always part of the community. And I said, what am I missing? How, you know, should I be thinking about this differently? And she said, I have one question for you, and is that, have you consulted with your grandmother? Have you called upon your ancestors to help you lead in the way you know how to lead? She was basically bringing my speech all back, <laughs> so deep and so internal. She, now, this is a picture of, her, of my grandma actually at Harvard. She traveled from the border of Mexico and Texas, McAllen, Texas, 
over um, three days, six different buses, um, speaking in broken English, um, and um, didn't even tell me she was coming. Like she told a cousin who told, you know, a, my mom who then texted my sister, called me, and I was on my way to New York City actually to look for apartments, and they said, come, come, because grandma's going to visit you. I'm like, well, when? And when, <laughs> and when will she show up? And um, she didn't even have a cell phone. So she shows up, all I get is a message saying, mija, aquí estoy en McDonald's. And so I had all my friends looking at it, and we found her at the McDonald's in South Station. And she was holding bags, and she was holding bags of fresh salsa she had made. She, had, she was holding bags of even queso fresco, because I missed that cheese, you know. And she brought me food. She, did, she just came with the same outfit. She's like, I don't need clothes. I'm just going to bring my, my baby some food. Um, and, and she is someone who keeps me grounded. If you, if you know me, you know my work, or you know some of the work, I, I always bring my grandma with me. Um, and I lost her a few years ago, but, you know, she is, for me, a place of great strength. Uh, and, and that's your core. That's the fire in your belly. That's home. Um, and, and from that place, that's the place you lead from, right? That is the place that you call home and that you can become unstoppable when you lead from that place of strength. I'm going to ask you to close your eyes for a minute and call for silence in the room. If you can place your hand on your heart, and feel the energy in the room. As the indigenous communities you, we honored always did. I'm gonna ask you to feel like what it's like to be home and how you build that in the world and to think about where your strength comes from, who grounds you, and just take a minute to think about that. From that place, you can open your eyes. Thank you. From that place, lead. From that very place that you were just with and imagined. Whatever home is for you is where you need to lead from. I call on each of you to, in the room to embrace your role as a leader from whatever seat you are in, to create culturally rich, relevant, affirming spaces for our youth and for each other, because adults need that love too. Now, we opened with Maya Angelou. She talks about the ache for home living in all of us, a place where we go as we are and not be questioned. Now, let's commit to shifting, to honoring her spirit and her legacy of shifting her definition a little bit and taking some responsibility for creating those spaces for our youth and for each other. The ache for home lives in all of us, the safe place we create versus we retreat to wherever we are, and where we proudly, and in our own voice, and in our own skin, be who we are. Thank you.